Hi, welcome to Easy Engineering. We're going to continue with the vortex tube. Um, last video we kind of started the different parts that make up a vortex tube. Today we're going to explain a little bit how it works and how you want it to work for most of your applications. Now, a quick review. A vortex tube takes compressed air, goes into the body, into the generator, which spins the air one way, then spins itself back inside itself the other way. One end gets very hot, one end gets very cold. The amount of uh, opening at the hot end determines how much flow and what the temperature is at the cold end. A little bit of a close-up on the generator. Uh, the air comes in, spins, spins one way, spins back inside itself, and there's a hole in the generator to let that cooling air come out the cold end. That's what basically happens at the generator. But when you use a vortex tube, where do you want to set the temperature? How cold do you want it? It's very important to know when you're using a vortex tube what you're doing with it. Do you want cold temperature or do you want a cooling effect? In most applications, people want the best cooling rate. Let me give you an example. Take a bowl of soup. Take a bowl of hot soup, put it in a refrigerator for two minutes. You take that bowl of soup out, it's still hot. And try this. Take that same bowl of soup at the original temperature, put it on a table and blow on it just with your breath. That's, that's mimicking a flow rate. It's going to cool the soup faster. So temperature is not the only thing that affects cooling rate. It's the flow rate of whatever you're trying to cool that also has a big effect on the cooling rate. Now the funny thing about the vortex tube is that if I want to reduce the temperature at the cold end, I actually have to reduce the flow coming out. If I have more air at the hot end, the temperature at the cold end will get lower. Okay? So what happens with the vortex tube is that the flow rate and the temperature are interdependent. The higher the flow rate, the less cold the temperature is. Okay. We've actually did a chart, did a graph, where we took a percentage of the air out the cold end and, and against the cooling rate. If there's no air coming out the cold end, obviously it's no flow, you're going to have no cooling rate. If 100% of the air goes out the cold end, there's no spinning action at the other end, so again, you're not going to have any, any cooling effect. But somewhere between 60 and 80% of the air coming out the cold end gives you the best cooling rate. The cooling rate is defined as some constant times the temperature difference, the temperature being the temperature of the cold end and a reference temperature of the outside, temperature that you're blowing into, let's say it's 100 degrees Celsius, and the flow rate. Now, think about this. The best cooling rate was somewhere between 60 and 80%. And by the way, this can change too. This graph can wiggle. Um, we found that if the reference temperature is very high, you're actually better off to have the uh, percentage of the air out the cold end at something like 60%. If the temperature is cooler, you're actually better off to have it at, at the other end. And then the same thing with the temperature of the compressed air going into the vortex tube. If the temperature of the compressed air going into the vortex tube is higher, you're better off at this level than the 60 than, than the 80. So somewhere between 60 and 80 seems to be an optimum level. What's interesting is that if you have the compressed air operating between 60 and 80 percent going up the cold end, you actually get a temperature somewhere around zero degrees Celsius coming out the cold end, which is actually very, very good because you have to consider condensation. You have to consider the moisture that's in the compressed air itself. Uh, instrument air in a factory, for example, is very, very dry. It has a dew point, which is the temperature at which uh, moisture will start to condense from the compressed air. It has a dew point of something like minus 40 degrees, very, very cold. So you can put, you can get very cold temperatures in here without having to worry about condensation. But a lot of regular factory air only has a dew point of around zero, zero, two or two degrees Celsius. So if you get below that temperature, that compressed air going at the cold end is going to start condensing water. You actually might get ice inside the vortex tube. 
And I've seen that happen. It's really quite interesting. It kind of goes like, all of a sudden the vortex tube will stop because you got an ice pond in there, and then it spits out the ice. It kind of goes like, like you know, it just pops out. It's quite funny. And they'll start up again. But you really don't want to have that. You want the vortex tube constantly running. So actually having the temperature around zero to plus two degrees Celsius or somewhere in that range is actually a very good way to operate the vortex tube for getting that maximum cooling rate. So, and as I explained before with the example of the bowl of soup, you want not only cold temperature, you want a flow rate. That's reasonable to do the cold, where optimum cooling rate. Now, having said that, there are some applications where people just want the very cold temperature. But if you're going to do that, uh, if you also want a very high cooling rate, you may actually have to use more vortex tubes than you normally would. Uh, if cooling rate was the only thing that was important. Okay, so that kind of explains to you how you would normally want to use a vortex tube and what you, what you really want to expect out of a vortex tube.